Welcome to episode 18 of the Quantum Science Seminar. It's all going to be about precision measurement today. Uh, as usual, we want your questions. Please email us your questions to quantumscienceseminar at gmail.com or use the YouTube uh, live chat at the right or at the bottom of the screen. We are also going to take a middle, uh, a little break in the middle of the talk to start answering some of these questions and um, then take another break to do it at the very end. Please also note, as usual, our, about a 30 second time delay between what you're seeing on YouTube and what we're between what we're doing here on Zoom. And with that, I actually have the honor of introducing our speaker today. So today we have Pete Schmidt from the uh, Physikalische Technische Bundesanstalt in uh, Germany and the University of Hanover. And uh, Pete studied physics at the University of Constance and in Portland, Oregon, actually, and then continued to do his PhD uh, in the group of Jürgen Rienek and Tilman V at Konstant and Stuttgart, if I understand correctly, on ultra-cold collisions with chromium atoms. I actually met Pete for the first time in Boulder, Colorado, where he was a postdoc in Dave Weinland's uh, Trapped Iron Group at the National Institutes of Standard, uh, Standards and Technology. And there, together with Till Rosenband, Pete was the driving force uh, in the creation of uh, one of the most precise and accurate optical frequency standards today which is based on a single trapped aluminum ion. To do spectroscopy on such an ion, Pete developed a new technique called quantum logic spectroscopy, which is also the subject of his talk today. Pete is a professor at the University of Hanover and leads the Institute for Experimental Quantum Metrology at uh, the German National Metrology Institute, PTB in Braunschweig. If you would like to ask Pete questions in person, please join us later. Um, Pete agreed to um, stay on for a bit to talk to you guys uh, in our Zoom meeting. I will post the link to this meeting in the YouTube chat at the end of the talk. And uh, with that, thank you, Pete, very much for agreeing to speak today. I'm excited to hear what's new in your group. And with that, please, uh, the stage is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, Sebastian, for the kind introduction. And uh, thanks to all the organizers of the Quantum Science Seminar. Uh, for allowing me to speak here uh, in this worldwide audience. Now, um, since not all of you may be aware what uh, Physikalische Technische Bundesanstalt is, um, I have this little slide that uh, introduces my location a bit. It's Germany's National Metrology Institute, so the, the, the NIST of Germany. Um, and it's actually the oldest National Metrology Institute, it has been founded in 1887 by uh, Hermann von Helmholtz and uh, Werner von Siemens. Uh, now, what you see on this picture is the location in Braunschweig, and I'm sitting right here in this tower um, in the so-called Lauer building. Um, and uh, the tasks of PTB are the determination of fundamental constants and the dissemination of the SI units. And for this, we develop new measurement techniques to realize the SI units uh, better and better. And uh, therefore, it's, it's a lot of fundamental research uh, that we do at PTB, uh, signified by a lot of PhD uh, students that we have and uh, many publications. Now, um, what I want to talk to you about today is quantum logic spectroscopy. And this is actually what the entire research in my group revolves around. It's the technique that we use uh, to build um, an aluminum ion clocks, for example. Um, we investigate highly charged ions as uh, novel frequency standards. We investigate complex molecules. Uh, and in particular molecular ions that are usually difficult to perform spectroscopy on. And we use quantum logic techniques to perform quantum engineering to improve our measurement uh, capabilities um, and develop novel techniques. And uh, we do that um, to make previously inaccessible systems accessible for precision spectroscopy uh, at highest resolution and accuracy for applications in astronomy relativistic geodesy, but also fundamental physics. Now, um, the main motivation that I'm uh, telling you today um, is fundamental physics. And actually, there's a lot that we do not yet understand um, about physics. For example, we do not know uh, how to unite all four fundamental forces because there's an 
there seems to be a fundamental incompatibility between gravity and the other three forces that we have. Um, we don't know what dark matter and dark energy are um, that make up most of the uh, matter in the universe. Um, uh, there's only 5% normal matter. And uh, it's very clear from cosmological observations that dark matter and dark energy should exist according to cosmological models. But we, we simply don't know what it is. Um, we don't even know why we exist because we cannot explain uh, the apparent asymmetry between the visible matter and antimatter in the universe because there's no mechanism that would explain uh, the large surplus in matter that we observe in the universe today after the Big Bang. Now, looking at these questions, um, you, you think naturally that you have to go to cosmology, for example, or high energy physics uh, to find answers to all of these questions. And obviously, uh, there has been a lot of progress in um, um, sort of confirming the standard model and uh, of particle physics and of cosmology um, that have been extremely successful in the past. But uh, taking advantage of the extremely high resolution uh, that we have in tabletop quantum optic experiments, we can um, hope that we can find sort of an, an afterglow of these big questions um, that we can detect using the extremely high resolution uh, available in our systems. Um, in particular, since some of the atomic and molecular systems are very sensitive probes to specific uh, physics beyond the standard model. Now, um, what kind of physics could that be? Uh, there's a beautiful review by Mariana Savranova and uh, co-workers that go into very much more detail than I can hear. Um, what, what to look for here. One thing that we can look for is a potential variation of fundamental constants. Uh, we can look uh, for uh, flaws in Einstein's uh, theory of relativity by, for example, probing the equivalence principle, uh, the redshift, um, or lower, uh, local Lorentz invariance, for example. Uh, we can look for parity violation that could explain uh, the surplus in matter that we observe in the universe by looking for energy differences and additional mechanisms to the known ones um, to look into energy differences in different enantiomers of molecules, for example. We can also look for a, a possible dipole moment of the electron in uh, using molecules where internal fields um, uh, make the search much more sensitive than in other systems. We can look for fist forces that could potentially explain dark or, or could be dark matter fields that couple um, quarks with electrons, for example, using isotope shift spectroscopy. And we can perform tests of QED by uh, performing precision spectroscopy on calculable atomic systems and compare uh, the results of the experiments to ab initio atomic structure calculations. Now, um, for all of that, um, you need to be able to control your atomic or your AMO system um, using the typical techniques that we that we love, yeah, like laser cooling, optical pumping, um, and uh, internal state detection via state dependent fluorescence, for example, and um, to make the most sensitive systems accessible um, to the, to this, uh, you need this laser cooling transition. Uh, but unfortunately, not all of the systems that you're interested in actually have such a laser cooling transition. And uh, this is where quantum logic uh, spectroscopy comes into the game, because with trapped ions, we can actually um, uh, trap a spectroscopy ion together with a logic ion in the same potential well of, a, of an ion trap, um, where we can potentially achieve very high accuracy. And um, owing to the very strong cooler interaction between the two ions, we can use the logic ion to sympathetically cool not only the motion of the spectroscopy ion, but also we can use a series of laser pulses to transfer the internal state of, from the spectroscopy ion to the logic ion and uh, detect it there uh, where we have uh, full control over the logic ion. So our, um, we, we have our beloved uh, quantum optics toolbox available for the logic ion um, and we use the logic ion as a probe 
Uh, for the spectroscopy ion, and we can also use a logic ion to control the internal states of the spectroscopy ion, so do internal state preparation. Now, you can view that as a composite system that combines the good controllability of the logic ion with the interesting spectroscopic features of your spectroscopy ion. And uh, as Sebastian already pointed out, uh, the first demonstration of quantum logic spectroscopy was the aluminum clock that we built some 15 years ago um, at NIST in Boulder. And uh, the latest generation of the uh, aluminum clock uh, that uh, is operated at NIST in Boulder again um, is uh, the aluminum clock with an uh, estimated systematic uncertainty of below 10 to the minus 18 in fractional frequency units. And, uh, Dave Leibrand actually gave a talk about the latest results from their group um, that you may find soon uh, under this link here. Now, um, I've introduced and motivated quantum logic spectroscopy to you already. And uh, what I want to uh, do today is uh, give you two examples um, where uh, quantum logic spectroscopy might uh, or is already uh, helping uh, to answer some of the uh, fundamental Christian physics questions in the future. And this is quantum logic spectroscopy of highly charged ions and uh, quantum logic spectroscopy of molecular ions. And um, I've been asked to keep this talk fairly simple, uh, simply because there's, um, the audience is supposedly from a very diverse field. Um, and uh, I try to stick to that. Yeah? So if you have more detailed questions that I'm able to cover here, yeah, please feel free uh, to ask um, in the according breaks for questions. Okay, let's get started uh, with quantum logic spectroscopy of highly charged ions. Now, um, in case you're used to neutral atoms or maybe singly charged ions, then your typical feel of the energy scales uh, will totally fail for highly charged ions. Because um, if you compare, for example, a neutral hydrogen with uh, uranium hydrogen like uranium, that's uranium 91 plus, uh, then the binding energy of uh, the last electron uh, goes from 10 EV to 140 kilo electron volts. The hyperfine splitting goes from micro electron volts into the visible regime, uh, electron volts, uh, so visible, visible laser transitions. QED effects uh, become strongly enhanced. They scale as a Z to the fourth power and uh, amount to 300 electron volts. And therefore you can perform highly accurate QED tests in such systems. At the same time, as illustrated in this uh, sort of artist picture, uh, for example, stark shifts polarizability goes down dramatically simply because the um, electron wave function shrinks um, by orders of magnitudes uh, due to the uh, high charge state of the remaining nucleus. Now, to give you a more specific example, let me show you the system that we are working with. This is um, uh, argon-13 plus in our case. It has the electronic structure of neutral boron. And a neutral, neutral boron um, has the um, uh, ground state fine structure splitting of a few hundred gigahertz. Um, is a P1 half, a P3 half sign structure splitting, and the first dipole allowed transition in boron um, is the P1 half to S1 half transition or the P to S transition at 250 nanometers. Now, for uh, the identical electronic configuration in argon 13 plus, that dipole allowed transition is at 19 nanometers, so far beyond anything that we can access with um, a, a tabletop laser. At the same time, the fine structure splitting. Uh, has been increased to 441 nanometers. It's right where we like our spectroscopy lasers to be. Uh, this is just one example where you can have optical transitions. If you go to higher charge states, you can have uh, hyperfine transitions in the optical regime. And uh, there are cases where you can have level crossings, yeah, where two uh, orbitals or two electronic configurations start to cross as a function uh, of the charge state, and you, in, in near that crossing, you can again have optical transition starting from the ground state. Now, um, why do we love highly charged ions uh, to test fundamental physics? First of all, they have a very simple electronic structure, and so we can improve our atomic structure theory by comparing experiments uh, to calculations. 
This is also the reason why they're the, the preferred choice for QED tests, where uh, groups like uh, Klaus Blaum, Sven Sturm, and, and others um, uh, measure defectors that can be calculated to many, many digits. And uh, comparing those measurements to QED calculations uh, is a test of QED in very strong fields where QED is expected to break down first. Um, now, uh, maybe some 10 years ago or so, uh, people have found out that uh, highly charged ions are actually uh, one of the most sensitive candidates to probe for a variation of the fine structure constant, alpha. Um, highly charged ions uh, are also very sensitive candidates uh, to search for a violation of local Lorentz invariance for the same reasons, actually, that it's very sensitive to alpha. Um, we can use highly charged ions also to probe for uh, fifth forces uh, that could couple electrons to nucleons um, in isotope shift measurements. And um, we can look for parity violations in XUV transitions, for example. And then um, at the, not, not the, the least application is, of course, because the electron cloud or the electron orbitals is, are very close to the nucleus, we can use electron spectroscopy to actually probe for nuclear effects in this case. And there's many more applications, actually. Now, um, let me give you one specific example, uh, which is uh, a potential variation of fundamental constants that can be related to, to dark matter searches. Now, um, all we know about dark matter is that it interacts gravitationally with normal matter uh, because of, um, for example, rotation curve of, of galaxies. Um, now, the question is, is there an interaction beyond the gravitational interaction between dark matter and normal matter? And um, if, so there's, there's a number of candidates for dark matter. Uh, it could, in the simplest case, be, for example, a scalar field um, that is simply superimposed um, or that, that, that we fly through on our spaceship Earth while we, we cross uh, through the universe. Now, that scalar field can uh, be composed of um, very light particles. In that case, it oscillates um, at measurable frequencies um, at the Compton frequency, for example. Um, that dark matter field could also be a topological field so that it uh, forms clumps and is gravitationally bound. And then we would fly through um, different densities of dark matter fields as we fly through the universe. Um, and uh, the effect that any new type of interaction would have, um, uh, any type of new interaction between dark matter and normal matter would have on our favorite atom would be that uh, the, it would change the energy levels of our, of our two-level system, for example. And uh, for us, that would look like an apparent change in, for example, fundamental constants, such as the fine structure constant that um, determines the electromagnetic strength of electromagnetic interaction, or, for example, um, the uh, ratio between uh, the electron to proton mass ratio. So for us, it would look like an apparent variation of fundamental constants. And so those constants could either oscillate or they could have, we could have transient effects if we fly through dark matter clumps. Now, uh, what would that do uh, to um, two different atoms or two different transitions in the same atom? Um, that would change, and here's a, the example of an oscillation, that would change the energy levels. And if we, for example, have two atomic clocks that are uh, based on these two transitions, then we can compare those clocks and we would see an oscillating frequency ratio, for example, that we could measure. Now, what we can calculate with fairly high accuracy is this uh, proportionality uh, constant K here that relates a relative change in the fine structure constant to a relative change in the transition energy here that we measure. Uh, and such comparisons have been performed uh, using sensitivity coefficients that are available in the best optical clocks. 
that range from very small numbers for strontium and aluminum to larger numbers in ytterbium and mercury, for example. And uh, by not having observed any change in the frequency ratios over, uh, uh, over a certain number of years, for example, one can plot such an exclusion plot here, as is shown here, where we have a relative change in the fine structure constant um, and a relative change in the electron to proton mass ratio. And um, what we have excluded is everything outside this white ellipse that you see here. And this is preliminary data uh, from frequency comparisons um, uh, from all over the world. The, the uh, constraint here is from the ytterbium strontium comparison um, at PTB. Now looking at these, so if you want to improve um, these bounds, you, you have to either continue comparing and make your, your clocks better, or um, you go to systems that have a higher sensitivity and allow you to restrict that regime um, uh, much faster. And such systems are, for example, highly charged ions that have about an order of magnitude um, almost larger sensitivity factors compared to uh, neutral atoms and singly charged ions here. And there, for example, it's Iridium-17 plus or um, charged state of uh, Californium that have been uh, proposed as clock candidates with which you can do um, uh, such comparison experiments. Now, um, to do that, actually, you need to bring highly charged ion spectroscopy to the level of the best available optical clocks that we have today. Um, and uh, for that, you need to make sure that the transitions that you're looking at actually have a very uh, low sensitivity to resonance shifts. That means, uh, for example, a low sensitivity to electric magnetic field perturbations um, and so forth. And uh, actually, the highly charged ion have some advantages here because uh, the high charge state suppresses a number of shifts. For example, the second order star shift uh, because the polarizability is very low. Uh, the linear Zeeman shift is not suppressed, but the second order Zeeman shift is uh, strongly suppressed typically. And also the electric quadrupole shift uh, that you can have in uh, trapped ion systems, for example, is uh, strongly suppressed in these systems. And uh, of course, there's a number of other requirements such that uh, you need to have very narrow transitions um, and it needs to be in a laser accessible regime. And all these conditions can actually be fulfilled by a certain highly charged ions. And there's actually a number of ions that have been proposed, uh, like, I, I don't know, maybe 20, 30 different species. And you can find a selection of those in this uh, review that we have written. Now, um, where is the state of the art of highly charged ion spectroscopy? And that's the state of the art before our experiments, I, I should mention. Uh, data has typically been obtained in so-called electron beam ion traps, and that's a uh, a plasma where we have an, an electron beam that is accelerated and focused by a magnetic field um, and then simply ionizes argon gas, for example, um, in a, a vacuum chamber. And then what you see here is actually fluorescence light uh, from, uh, from um, electron beam excitation of the transition that you're looking into. You can image that fluorescence uh, on, into a grating spectrometer and then take spectra like those here, where you see here the wavelength in nanometer and then uh, the strength of fluorescence that you observe. The lines here are split very far because of the strong magnetic field that you have in these EBITs. And this is actually uh, one of the most accurate in EBIT measurements that is available. The line widths here are 45 gigahertz um, and they can be resolved down to 150 megahertz and the reason why they are so broad is simply because uh, this is a hot plasma with mega kelvin temperatures so it's doppler broad now um, th this is a, a, a chart uh, derived from the mist atomic spectral database um, selected on optical transitions um, that are in there and you can see here the nuclear charge and here the number of electrons and typically uh, what we do in quantum optics is look at neutral or singly charged um, atoms that are here on the diagonal and the subdiagonal. So there's a lot of transitions known here uh, for all um, isotopes and elements. Um, and uh, the entire white void here is the realm of 
highly charged ions where only very little data is known. I should mention this is not complete because there's uh, not every, every data point is yet in the NIST atomic uh, database. Okay, now uh, how to improve over that? Um, we need to trap those ions in an environment where we can achieve high accuracy. And as all, uh, probably many of you know, um, ion traps are a, a very good um, platform to actually do that. Uh, we can trap the ions in electrode configurations such as this. This is an Innsbruck style ion trap where we apply radio frequency field on those fields, on, on those blades to provide radio confinement. And then we apply DC fields on these end caps to provide um, axial confinement. And all in all, we then have a 3D harmonic confinement uh, with um, oscillation frequencies at a few megahertz. And that's very advantageous because that allows us to perform recoil-free absorption in our system. We can also trap the ions for hours, days, or even months in some cases. Um, that allows us to uh, have extremely long interrogation times in our system. The ions are trapped in the zero of the electric field and that uh, leads to very small trap induced shifts. And then we can, of course, isolate them from the environment in a UHV chamber We have laser cooling. And except for the nuclear interaction, there's not many other interactions uh, that allows us to achieve very high accuracy as uh, signified, for example, in the ytterbium uh, clock uh, operated by Eckhart Pike. Uh, in the building next to me um, and uh, colleagues, uh, Nils Hultemann, for example, uh, but also, of course, at the, all, all the other iron clocks, for example, at NIST, the aluminum clock, which is currently the most accurate clock in the world. Now, uh, what to do? Um, we need to bring highly charged ions from this nasty, noisy environment of these um, electron beam ion traps uh, into uh, a, a pore trap environment, and then we need to find a solution for the fact that uh, there's no cycling transition for laser cooling because we've just learned Doppler cooling is the major issue here. Um, and uh, the way we do that is we uh, bring them into a pore trap and then perform a quantum logic spectroscopy using a co trap logic ion. Now, how do the do that, um, we've set up ex an experiment in a very fruitful collaboration with uh, Jose Crespo's group at the NPIK in Heidelberg. Um, we have built um, um, a, a cryogenic supply line here because highly charged ions are very prone to background gas collisions because as soon as you have a background gas collision, you lose the ion because of uh, charge transfer. So we need a cryogenic vacuum. Uh, for this, we have to uh, we, ha we have set up a cryogenic supply line uh, to have uh, a pore trap operated at four Kelvin here in this vibration isolated science chamber. We also have set up um, a miniature or compact um, electron beam ion trap using permanent magnets uh, that uh, where we can breed our highly charged ions using electron impact ionization. We then uh, extract the highly charged ions from the EBIT uh, along this beam line. They're bent, then they're a time of light uh, charge to mass selected that we only have, for example, our argon 13 plus. They're slowed down in this uh, deceleration stage here and then injected into a pore trap that operates at these cryogenic temperatures um, that you see here. This picture is a linear pore trap where we have pre-trapped and laser cooled uh, a cloud of beryllium ions uh, that you see here. And then once we inject the highly charged ions, um, we see a dark void popping up here um, inside the crystal. And then we know we have trapped a highly charged ion uh, uh, in there. And then uh, we uh, essentially apply parametric heating to get rid of all beryllium ions except for one. Um, and that prepares a two ion crystal uh, made out of a highly charged ion and a beryllium ion, which is the starting point of quantum logic uh, spectroscopy. Now the total preparation time for this situation starting from scratch is a few minutes and the lifetimes that we observe are on the order of uh, three quarters of an hour or so. Okay. Um, we then apply quantum logic spectroscopy. And the basic idea um, of quantum logic with trapped ions dates back to this seminal paper by Ignacio Sirac and Peter Soller, 
um, at the time at the University of Innsbruck uh, from 1995, where, we, uh, where they proposed the idea of doing quantum logic with trapped ions in linear pore traps, where you use the collective motion of the uh, trapped ions to transfer quantum information between them. It was Dave Weiland who had the idea uh, to use these techniques, not only for quantum information processing, but also to do precision spectroscopy. And he was the one who came up with the idea of quantum logic spectroscopy uh, that was then implemented by us uh, in the first aluminum clock. How does it work? How does the system look like? Uh, we have a, a two-level system. Uh, where we have a ground state and a metastable excited state that lives long enough uh, such that we can actually spectrally resolve um, the individual levels of motion of that uh, two-level atom inside um, the trapping potential. So we have a trapping potential, of a frequency, a trapping frequency of a small omega that is much larger than gamma, the line width of this transition here. Um, that uh, forms a coupled system of motion and uh, internal two, two uh, qubit or two uh, qubit two level system that we can fan out um, and drive transitions in between. Uh, we can drive uh, selectively in this case, in this result sideband regime, as we call it, we can drive selectively carrier transitions uh, by choosing a laser uh, detuning that uh, we only drive transitions that change the electronic state, but not address the motional state. Uh, by tuning to the blue sideband, as we call it, uh, we change the um, emotional state by adding one quantum of motion uh, when starting from the ground state. And we can remove one quantum of motion uh, when starting from the ground state by simply tuning to the so-called red sideband transition here. Okay, now, um, here you can see such a spectrum uh, with, uh, so I've left out the carrier, but these are the, the sidebands of this two ion crystal uh, of a highly charged ion and a single beryllium ion in our pore trap. And these are the two axial modes and we have two modes. Uh, one mode is the so-called in-phase mode and one mode with a, the other mode with a higher frequency is the outer phase mode that you can see both here. So here are uh, red, um, sidebands of the outer phase mode, uh, here of the in phase mode, and here are the blue sidebands of those two modes. And these are probe modes on the beryllium ion. Now we can uh, determine from just a single beryllium ion frequencies where we would expect the joint motional frequencies uh, of, the, of the coupled modes for different charge state of argon. And you can clearly see that you can distinguish argon, argon 13 plus from 12 plus and 14 plus here. Now uh, we can apply sideband cooling on the beryllium ion uh, by simply driving the red sideband transition and then performing some sort of repumping um, to reinitialize in the electronic ground state. And if we do that, um, we essentially remove the red sideband because from the n equals zero state, there's no transition uh, possible uh, to, uh, because there's no uh, n equals minus one state here. Um, and from the residual excitation here, we can actually derive something like the temperature, uh, which would correspond to a few microkelvins in, 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 uh, for this mode in this case. Okay, now we're ready uh, to do quantum logic spectroscopy. Uh, we have our two ion system in the motional and electronic ground state. We then apply a spectroscopy laser to the argon ion that puts the argon ion in general into a superposition of ground and excited state. And in typical spectroscopy experiments, you, you would detect now by doing some um, state dependent fluorescence, which we cannot do because we don't have a cycling transition in argon 13 plus. Uh, instead, we apply a red sideband pulse that maps this electronic superposition into a motional superposition of the uh, two ion crystal being uh, in the n equals zero Fox state or the n equals one Fox state, which is illustrated as a motion, but it's actually not moving, of course. Yeah? Uh, for the expert, it's a swap gate between the internal degrees of freedom and the motional degrees of freedom. You can reverse that step on the beryllium ion again using a red sideband and map the motional superposition back into an electronic superposition 
uh, this time on the beryllium, and we can detect that uh, uh, then the internal state uh, in the beryllium, which is um, a one-to-one -one correspondence of the original state we, that we produced after spectroscopy on the art on 13 plus. We have done that um, in the case of um, uh, this highly charged ion spectroscopy. Here you see the spectroscopy laser detuning from resonance, excitation probability, um, and we have here fully limited line widths of 65 hertz uh, with a resolution of about 5 hertz in this case. We've also set ourselves onto resonance and then performed Rabi flopping um, on that clock transition um, in, or, or fine structure transition in argon 13 plus. And the defacing that you see here is strictly dominated by the excited state lifetime of about 10 milliseconds of this transition. Uh, we've made a dedicated um, lifetime measurement just to demonstrate that you can use this technique also to perform precision lifetime measurements. I should mention that uh, uh, we could only do these experiments because we happen to have the most, uh, one of the most accurate laser of the world uh, next door here at uh, PDB, operated by uh, Uwe Ster and Eric Bengler at PDB. Um, and we transfer lock our laser, our spectroscopy laser, to this uh, silicon cavity stabilized laser um, operated by this group. Now, um, of course, uh, Argon 13 plus is not, the fine structure is not a two level system, but rather um, a, um, a multi level system. And by implementing quantum logic assisted uh, state preparation, uh, we could actually drive all of these transitions. And you see the result here. It's, it's a zoom out just to compare with calculations. Uh, we have here the dashed lines are sort of the semi classical long G factor calculations. Uh, then there's Dirac calculations performed uh, by this group here. Um, that's fully that's relativistic. We can then take into account electron interactions. Then the deviation part becomes larger again, and only if we do a full uh, calculate QED calculation, we find agreement uh, between experiment and calculations. And in fact, uh, our measurements that are shown here uh, confirm the theoretical predictions uh, by, by these groups here and uh, falsify essentially the predictions uh, of the theory um, from these uh, two uh, papers here. Okay, and you can view that as a QED test of an excited state G factor. And uh, just to put this into perspective, um, these are is a historic evolution of the relative accuracy of highly charged ion spectroscopy. There's a more recent penning trap measurement, and then our measurement um, has currently or recently been improved to 0.3 hertz even, and uh, we see currently no limitation in going even further in terms of accuracy down here. And uh, let me show you two more slides before we come to the first uh, question round. Uh, first, let me briefly summarize. I hope I could convince you that we can now do precision spectroscopy on highly charged ions and can address some of the fundamental physics questions with that. Uh, we have achieved full quantum optics control over a highly charged ion. We've performed uh, the first coherent spectroscopy of a highly charged ion as well, determined defectors and atomic lifetimes. And now the beauty of the quantum logic spectroscopy technique really is that this is a very universal spectroscopy scheme because um, most of our infrastructure revolves around the logic ion, the beryllium ion that we use. Um, and we can simply choose any other highly charged ion and do um, a similar spectroscopy on that. Yeah? And what, all what we have to change is the spectroscopy laser. Now, where are we heading from there? Um, we can, uh, we want to operate the first highly charged ion optical clock, do a full evaluation of systematics on this transition, verify isotope shift calculations that we have done together with uh, Vladimir Yerochin and uh, Andrei Sushikov here at PDB, um, and then extend isotope shift spectroscopy to calcium isotope to search for the fifth forces I briefly mentioned. And if you want to know more about this, you can uh, view my talk uh, on the fundamental physics seminar that was on the uh, reference on the previous slide. Now in future, uh, in the further future, we want to um, focus on real uh, clock candidates. For example, um, 
niobium 12 plus um, or look into alpha sensitive level crossing transitions, for example, pesodumium 9 plus, iridium, and uh, californium. And the ultimate goal is to do optical clock like spectroscopy of highly charged ions to test fundamental physics. And I think uh, with that, I would be ready for the first round of questions. Yeah, well, thank you very much, Pete, for the really interesting and engaging talk so far. Um, we have quite a few questions, um, so let me pick a few of those and ask them now and uh, maybe save some others to later. So the first question is, um, are there specific nuclei when you go to sort of choose the ions you're using in your experiment that are particularly useful to detect new physics, or is it mostly a question of getting the right mass and the right charge? Uh, ah, yeah. If sort of specific nuclei that are particularly good, um, then what are the features that you're looking for? Um, yeah. So uh, there's different there's different types of fundamental physics tests, obviously. Yeah. So for example, for the isotope uh, shift spectroscopy, you want um, uh, nuclei with no nuclear spin, ideally, and as many isotopes as you can get your hand on. Yeah. And uh, there, the simplest nucleus uh, and the simplest electronic structure that you can have with uh, many isotopes is actually calcium. Because there we have stable calcium 40, 42, 44, 46, and 48. Uh, those are five isotopes uh, that we can then perform isotope shift spectroscopy on, and then hopefully put bounds on fifth forces that would couple, for example, neutrons to electrons, because that's really the only parameter that you change in isotope shift spectroscopy. Okay. Um, so thanks. Um, uh, to what extent then, uh, you know, when you look at the choice of your um, other ion, particularly with the, um, with, with the sort of quantum logic spectroscopy, um, to what extent do you have to take care of the influence of the other ion, if you like, on the, um, the spectroscopy ion? Mm -hmm. uh, is it the case that sort of this massively reduced polarizability of the highly charged ion means that it's not very sensitive to that? Mm -hmm. um, or, or do you really have to be particular in how you choose your interrogation ion to match the spectroscopy yeah. ion? No, actually, the, the only thing that interacts between the two ions is actually the, the electric field. So it's a cooler interaction. Um, and the cooler interaction, of course, acts on the electronic structure as a whole. Yeah? So there's no, with sort of the, the, the zeroth order term of the cooler interaction, there's no problem with that. And this will be all the same for all species and will not lead to any systematic shifts. However, electric field gradients can, of course, couple to electric quadrupoles of the electronic structure. And that needs to be taken care of. And um, that can be either calculated or measured uh, to, a, to a good extent. And as I've mentioned already, um, the electric protocol moment that any electronic configuration in a highly charged ion may have is strongly suppressed simply because the, the entire electron cloud is, is shrunk, is much smaller than for neutral atoms or single charged ions. Other than that, um, um, there are some requirements, of course, for in terms of stability. Um, you need to be with your highly charged ion close to the instability regime of pore traps. Um, there are certain regimes, certain charge to mass regimes for which pore traps are stable. And that's really the only requirement that you have in this case. Hey. Thank you. And um, we'll take maybe one more question before we um, uh, move on to the, the last 10 minutes of the talk. Um, so you, you were just talking briefly about, uh, the, about clocks specifically. So what's the hope with these things maybe of um, bringing the sort of highly charged ion spectroscopy to the level of these sort of aluminum ion clocks, for example? Mm -hmm. It seems from what you said that there, is a, there are large factors of advantage for the highly charged ions because of the reduced effects of external fields. Um, so what's the chance of really being competitive with the state-of-the-art optical clocks? So I, th I think in the end, um, it is possible. These are all technical issues that you have to solve. For example, the linear Zeeman effect you have to strongly suppress uh, because um, that's uh, in, in, all, in, in most transitions that have been investigated, that will be the, the, the dominant shift um, uh, as far as I understand uh, or have, have looked into the system. Um, I would say that it is possible to be on par with uh, the most advanced clocks. 
Um, but I would not say that this is the most prominent features for uh, highly charged ion. I think that just the combination of being at the sort of 10 to the minus 18 level with the highly charged ions and their high sensitivity to new physics effects, that, that makes a game changer because, for example, the aluminum ion is not sensitive to any uh, new physics that we know of. Um, it, it's quite the opposite. It's one of the most sensitive systems that you can imagine. Um, and therefore, just the combination of being able to perform spectroscopy at the 10 to the minus 18 level, potentially, and uh, the high sensitivity to new physics is what makes highly charged ions, in, at least from my perspective, very attractive. So, so that sounds really exciting. Um, so with that, I think we'll um, save the remaining questions uh, yeah. for 10 minutes time at the end of the talk. Um, looking forward to the... Okay. Uh, the so I, I think, I, I'm not sure how I am with time. Yeah, I think we're quite advanced. So I, I may, may take a shortcut actually yeah, towards the end. Okay, now let me uh, come to the second example that um, I want to show you. And this is quantum logic with molecular ions. Um, now, I've shown you already that you can uh, perform optical clock comparisons uh, to put bounds on uh, a potential variation of the fine structure constant and the electron to proton mass ratio. Now, um, if you look very closely, then the sensitivity to the electron to proton mass ratio comes actually from comparison with cesium, because the cesium transition frequency determines uh, is dependent on that ratio. However, it's not quite clear um, what the sensitivity factor is because uh, nuclear models come into play to, um, to actually calculate the sensitivity factor and um, that's not very satisfactory. Now, why is it interesting to actually look into the electron to proton uh, charge uh, uh, to electron to proton mass ratio because it's um, predicted to vary 40 times stronger than a potential variation in the fine structure constant. Now, um, as I already mentioned, uh, this is model dependent in the clock comparison and uh, cesium is operated at 9.2 gigahertz. So we um, have very large statistical uncertainties uh, from that. And uh, that uh, of course is a limitation and we can possibly overcome this limitation by doing um, um, row vibrational optical by probing row vibrational optical transitions in molecules simply because the row vibrational transitions directly depend on either the square root of the electron to proton mass ratio or uh, directly linear in terms of the rotation. And uh, that makes it uh, very attractive to build optical clocks based on, uh, for example, vibrational overtone transitions in molecules. Now, how do we do that? Um, again, molecules, as you know, uh, typically have no closed cycling transitions. There are a few examples where this can work and has been demonstrated uh, very successfully in recent years to work, but not the most interesting candidates typically for these searches. And again, uh, quantum logic spectroscopy comes to the rescue because we can trap a molecular ion together with a logic ion. In this case, it's magnesium. And magnesium hydride plus um, and use quantum logic spectroscopy to map the molecules internal state or detect it. Um, uh, we can map it onto the motional state and then uh, detect it via the atoms internal state. And again, the atomic ion is a sensor for the molecular ion and we can also use the atomic ion to control the molecular ion's internal state. Um, and that makes potentially molecular ions accessible for spectroscopy. And let me briefly introduce uh, to you our uh, system that we have been investigating, Magnesium Hydride Plus. We have here a transition at about 280 nanometers. And uh, what we can do now, you, if you zoom in here, you see a vibrational structure and the gray area is actually the rotational structure that is then zoomed in here in this picture where we've just uh, picked or shown two rotational states of the ground state and the electronic excited state. Now, how can we uh, sort of determine or detect the internal state, internal row vibrational state of that molecular ion? What we can do is we can apply um, 
a, a Raman transition or uh, depending on the picture, you have an oscillating optical dipole force um, onto that molecular ion. And if the molecular ion in this example here is the J equals one state, then it will feel a force that is oscillating exactly at the emotional frequency of the joint ion crystal here, of the ions in the trap. And starting from the motion of ground state, we'll set that uh, ion crystal into motion. And that motion we can detect on the magnesium logic ion. And then we know that uh, the magnesium uh, hydride molecule has been in the J equals one um, rotational state in the vibrational ground state. How we can choose which rotate, row vibration state to detect. Um, here is a plot of all transitions as a function of the laser detuning here. That's this detuning of um, the Raman lasers that we apply. And as you can see, if we zoom in here by choosing an appropriate detuning, we can actually isolate uh, the interaction of this J equals one state, for example, from the J equals six state um, in uh, this um, uh, manifold of transitions. And so we have operated our system um, on the two slopes of the J equals one pro-vibrational transition um, uh, to the electronically excited state. Uh, so the uh, rotational state selectivity uh, is determined via uh, the laser detuning in this case. Now we've done that experiment. Um, so we performed ground state cooling via the logic ion. We then applied spin motional mapping uh, similar uh, to what you've seen on the highly charged ion case, um, we then applied um, an optical dipole force, an oscillating dipole force that would ex um, excite the joint motion of the ion crystal if and only if the molecule uh, is in the J equals one state. And then we would detect that motional excitation on the logic ion and detect it there. And now, uh, the molecular ion is driven by a black body radiation between different rotational states in the, in, in the electronic and vibrational ground state. And eventually, it will end up in the J equals one state. And then the dipole force will excite the, uh, the motion of this joint ion crystal that we detect as an excitation signal here on the magnesium ion for a few seconds. And then uh, it leaves that state again, and the signal goes away. So what you see here is actually the quantum jump of a single molecular ion observed live in the laboratory into the J equals one row vibration rotational state and out of it again. And the time scales uh, match quite nicely um, wave function Monte Carlo simulations where we see here as a function of time uh, in which row vibrational or rotational state of the electronic ground state um, the ion, uh, the molecule actually is, and it's typically on the second time scale for the J equals one state in this case. Now we've done um, uh, measurements as a function of the detuning to map out this uh, resonance here um, on the blue and the red detuned side. And uh, from the fit, we can determine um, the center frequency here, which agrees with an older measurement. However, this was only a demonstration experiment. This is not a narrow line. So in the future, we plan to look into narrow line uh, transitions um, of um, other species. And I should mention uh, that uh, this was uh, the first demonstration of a non-destructive uh, state detection in a molecular ion. And in the meantime, uh, there has been uh, work by the NIS group around James Chow and um, from the village group in Basel. Um, that have um, extended uh, our scheme. So this group has used a different uh, scheme with the party tuned lasers, uh, whereas the village group uh, has demonstrated our scheme with uh, N2+. Plus. Yeah. And there's also a talk, um, or has been a talk by James Chow um, in another uh, online seminar. Okay, now um, I think since we're running out of time, I will just very quickly flip through these slides here. What we've done here is actually um, we've measured um, in this phase-based diagram a displacement, a motional displacement of the ions from um, the ground state um, of motion. Yeah? So what we detect in our scheme is the, is, is the a remaining fraction of population in the motional ground state. And um, our detection scheme is limited by 
uh, how well we can actually discriminate the excited motion from the ground state motion. And obviously, we can uh, play tricks here. For example, you can use uh, squeeze states uh, or Schrodinger cat states to enhance um, this displacement detection here. And uh, what we have done is we have actually used uh, motional fox states um, to um, enhance the slope. And uh, this is a, a Wigner function representation um, of uh, the uh, displacement detection, where you can see here that the slope here is much faster because we have a zero crossing here and then uh, a single oscillation. If we use then equals one motional fox state for this type of experiment, and if you use higher fox states, the, the slope steepens uh, and you get more oscillations here. And uh, if you do that and uh, do a full scheme, uh, then we were able to show that we can actually uh, perform displacement measurements that are below the standard quantum limit, which is determined essentially by the n equals by the classical scheme that I uh, showed in uh, one of the earlier slides. And you can uh, clearly see that we're here in the non-classical regime um, and could half in our fully, uh, fully fledged measurement scheme the uh, measurement time uh, to achieve a certain resolution here in, in displacement. Um, and if you want to uh, compare that to a false measurement, uh, we've measured uh, 112 yocto newton per square root of hertz using this, uh, this uh, type of system. OK, with that, I'm at the end. Um, I hope I could convince you that we've made first steps um, towards um, quantum optic control of molecular ions. I've shown you that uh, we have demonstrated non-destructive state detraction and very simple spectroscopy schemes that in the meantime have been extended by other groups. And I could show you that you can use quantum state engineering, motional quantum state engineering, uh, to actually enhance measurements of these types in the future. And what we want to do uh, in the future with our molecules is move to, uh, from a fundamental physics point of view, more interesting species, for example, O2 plus. So we've set up a molecular beam line uh, to be able to trap uh, mole uh, molecular ions uh, together with our uh, logic ion and then uh, do ter deterministic state preparation uh, and achieve full control over the molecular state and then perform high precision spectroscopy. And my personal dream at least is uh, that uh, we can extend this even to more to, to mole not only diatomic molecules, but to molecules that are more complex, and then um, have two molecules um, uh, in the same trap together with a logic ion, and then entangle the two molecules, and then measure the tiny energy difference arising only from parity violation in those molecules. And with that, I'm at the end, and I would like to thank my fantastic group here in yellow, uh, the people who were drivers on the highly charged ion experiment, uh, where I uh, want to acknowledge a very fruitful collaboration with Jose Crespo and his group, and in red, um, the people involved with the molecular ion experiment. And uh, I'd like to thank our collaborators or other collaborators, the funding agencies, and you, of course, for your attention. Thanks. So thank you very much, Pete, for that, um, that really interesting introduction to this, um, this fascinating toolbox of um, things that you're building up here and the, uh, the fundamental physics that it, um, that it has the potential to open up. So really fascinating stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we have several questions, um, uh, many of them sort of about the, the outlook and the big picture of these things. Um, the first sort of in the, the YouTube chat from, um, from Yanni Tsuo, I hope I've pronounced that correctly, who thanks you for the nice talk and asks um, what the limitations are of highly charged ion clocks. So in general, you know, what, what are the ultimate limits of these, these systems that you're building? Um, so certainly the linear Zeeman effect that I already mentioned earlier is going to be a challenge, which is a technical challenge. You have to keep the magnetic field sufficiently constant um, over the probe time. But I think this is a, a, a something that we can live with. Another uh, thing that we actually worry about um, is sympathetic cooling. Um, I haven't gone into much detail, but um, as you can imagine, um, actually, yeah, uh, here we can cool very, very well. Yeah? Um, but uh, we, we have problems, and we're currently investigating this as we speak, actually, yeah? 
um, the radial knots yeah, um, um, are much less well coupled simply because the distance between the highly charged ion and the singly charged ions is about is tens of microns actually. And uh, therefore, the radial motion is strongly decoupled. So we have one mode where the highly charged ion moves a lot, and the other mode where the logic ion moves a lot. And the mode where the highly charged ion moves a lot and the logic moves very little is very weakly cooled off. And together with the heating rates that we have in these types of traps, that puts a limit on the final temperature that we can achieve in the radial direction. And that will ultimately leave um, the time dilation shift or second order Doppler shift. Um, and this is going to be a limitation. Again, this can be viewed as a technical limitation simply because um, by technical improvements, we can reduce the heating rate and then this should no longer be um, a, a big issue. Um, this, these are actually the only sort of eminent uh, technical limitations that we are currently facing, but we don't know what's, what's coming. Yeah? Uh, you only will see that once you do a full uh, evaluation of systematic effects, um, um, which we are currently doing. Okay, that would be very interesting to, to see going forward. So certainly, certainly very exciting. Uh, so another sort of question then about the, the possibilities in these systems, you know, with respect to, to other precision spectroscopy systems. And with these highly charged molecular ions, um, how do you see the comparison with sort of more conventional uh, molecular EDM measurements? So oh, to yeah. what extent do you see that these systems could compete with or surpass in sensitivity mm -hmm. at the more conventional molecular EDM measurements? So I, I think it's, it will be very difficult to compete actually with the extremely advanced um, molecular EDM measurements that have been done already in David DeMille's group, but also in Eric Cornell's group on, on ions. Um, simply because they, they have a lot more signal to noise. They, they use clouds of ions or um, a beam of, of molecules. Um, and it will be very difficult to compete with those measurements, actually. Uh, we will have, um, we would have the advantage of having an extremely clean environment. So systematic effects um, might be much easier to characterize in our system. Uh, but in terms of signal to noise ratio, we would not really win. Yeah? And uh, since these EDM sensitive transitions are actually, um, I, I think they're not in the optical regime, but a rather microwave regime, then you just need to go for signal to noise ratio. Yeah? Uh, we can only um, suffer to work with a single particle because we have optical transitions where we can have very long probe times um, and therefore um, get a very good statistical uncertainty level, that, despite the fact that we just have one quantum observer. So I'm, I'm, I'm not proposing that we would be competitive or the, the single molecular experiments can be competitive in the near future with the EDM experiments. Okay. Um, uh, another question in the chat from Yanni Tsuo, who, um, who asks why you chose um, beryllium ions specifically. Ah, okay. That's because of the charge to mass ratio um, that uh, nicely suits uh, many highly charged ions which, that we typically work with. Um, so for argon 13 plus, it's, al it, it, it's almost a match. Yeah. Um, and um, this, is, this is one of the reasons because it's quite universal to a very large class of highly charged ions that we want to investigate in the future. Okay. And uh, so then one sort of final bigger picture question. Um, obviously there is a lot of work in uh, looking into fundamental physics through cosmology and high energy physics. And at the same time, uh, there's this array of really interesting atomic physics experiments now with precision measurement and uh, of this sort with ions and with, with molecular gases. Um, how do you see sort of the comparison and the complementarity of the approaches in these, these quite different experimental fields? Do you find normally that, um, uh, that you are probing something that maybe could be seen a different way in high energy physics? Or um, are you normally looking at a very different aspect of the, um, the, the fundamental theories through what you can probe in atomic physics? But mm -hmm. where's the complementarity and potential for crosstalk or collaboration even between yeah. the high energy physics and atomic physics? That's a very good question. And uh, I think in recent years, the, 
high energy physics community had, has actually re started to realize the potential that lies uh, within the uh, low energy atom optics types of experiments. And uh, they have started to sort of um, translate their models that they have for certain aspects um, into effects that we could possibly observe. Yeah? And uh, the, the, one of the first outcomes that I'm at least aware of is, is this isotope uh, shift spectroscopy uh, that our co-host Ofer Fürstenberg is actually involved in, um, but also Rui Oseri and Gilad Perez um, at, at Weizmann, who's actually a, a high energy physicist. Yeah? So they, they stuck their heads together and came up with this idea that was initiated from the high energy physics side, actually. Um, and there are um, measurements um, in the high, uh, I think, from the high energy physics community in this um, uh, type of fifth force experiments uh, that we could, um, uh, that, that, so they have contributed to exclude these fifth forces, but I think our atom atomic physics measurements can exclude potentially a larger area than, than, than what they were able uh, to exclude. Now there's other models like uh, Relaxion models, for example. Um, these are models of uh, potential dark matter candidates um, that solve um, certain problems in high energy physics, uh, like um, um, in, in, in this case, I, I don't remember, uh, which uh, specific problem they, they are solving. Um, uh, I think the hierarchy pro problem is solved by the Relaxion model and um, Relaxion stars uh, that are essentially uh, a, a certain form of these topological dark matter fields yeah, could be detected exactly using the techniques that I was describing earlier. So uh, in a way, I think we are complementary, complementary uh, to the high energy experiments because we're, we can look at different aspects that they that they can typically look into. So thank you very much again, Pete, for the really fascinating talk. Um, it was really fantastic. And um, uh, Sebastian will mention this in a moment, but for the other questions we weren't able to answer, Pete will fill things in. And there's a chance to join the Zoom conversation to, um, to have a further chat with Pete in a moment. Uh, thanks again, Pete, and I'll pass back to Sebastian. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Pete, also from my side for a very interesting and very cool talk. So I'd like to take this opportunity to also remind everybody of our very first young research session on uh, November 5th, where we'll have uh, three talks by you guys. So uh, if you have not sent us your uh, data, please do go to the nomination page on our website for all the details and tell us about your cool new things that you've done recently. So next week, we'll have another talk by Misha Lukin, who will be talking about programmable quantum systems using uh, atom arrays. And if you want to know what we're doing, get notified of what we're doing, please go to our website, uh, subscribe to our email list, um, our Google Calendar. You can follow us on Twitter. And uh, you should certainly check out our sister seminar, the virtual AMO seminar, where tomorrow our very own Leticia Taruel will be talking about engineering chiral uh, uh, solitons and gauge fields in Bose-Einstein condensates. Uh, if you want to join us uh, for a, another Q&A session with Pete, I'm sure there's many more questions, please uh, uh, use the Zoom link I just pasted into the YouTube chat and uh, join us here. Let's have a conversation. Thank you for your interest and we hope to see you again next uh, week. Same time, same place. Bye. Bye.